Hi students, so this is another lecture in anthropology class. We're on chapter three. We're talking about the um, anthropological research process. It's called ethnography. I've got the word um, behind me on the board here, ethnography. Anyway, um, it is uh, the process that we gather data. It's also the results of the data. So I'll give you the, the definition of that in just a second. And also, this chapter is going to cover the um, background and the history of cultural anthropology. Um, what did ethnography, how did people go about doing ethnography in the past? How did people go about um, collecting data and doing their field work? There's a, um, a vocabulary word from this unit. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we're going to cover. And the information in this lecture is really important to combine with information from cultural relativism units and ethno, eth, uh, ethnocentrism units from previous lessons, and also the components of, col of um, culture that we talked about in chapter two. You need to have all of your notes from those first two chapters and chapter three really well organized um, and thorough uh, and available to you so that you can complete the first project that is available for you in Blackboard um, online. So, um, so take really good notes um, on this chapter. Stop the video as often as you need to and write stuff down. Um, re repeat things and make sure that you have access to this video so that you can be successful on project one because that's what, that's what we all want, okay, for your success on that assignment. So um, this doing anthropology chapter is about something called ethnography. So ethnography, as um, you know, has two definitions to it. It. So it's one of those words in the dictionary that will have a dictionary definition number one and then a dictionary definition number two. So we use it both ways like that in, um, in uh, anthropology, okay? So we'll, we'll use that word both ways. So the first definition is the research process itself. It's the research process of collecting information, you collect info through uh, something we call field work, and in particular these days, um, in particular these days the particular kind of field work that we do is called participant observation. There's other ways to conduct research in anthropology. Um, however, what we're going to focus on in this lecture is talking about participant observation. Uh, the results of these um, chapter lectures at the end of um, at the end of this unit, your first project, you're going to have to evaluate an ethnography that was done through participant observation. So we're going to focus on that in this lecture. Okay. In particular, participant observation. All right, so there is the definition, the first dictionary definition of this word. And the second dictionary definition of this word is the result. The results that are published or provided published or provided to the public or to whoever your audience is who's going to be interested in the information that you've gathered about the particular culture you've, you've been investigating. So the results that are published um, for others to see and learn from. Now, um, of course, you can publish a book you can publish a documentary film. You can publish a blog. You can have an, a series, you know, an Instagram channel or a YouTube channel, um, and you can have a lot of results, you know, little mini videos or whatever um, that you publish on social media. There's a whole bunch of ways these days to produce the results, and there's a whole bunch of ways to do participant observation these days, and there's a whole bunch of places where we do field work these days that's different from historically where we did these things um, in. In, in the past in anthropology. So this is our research process. Ethnography is our research process in um, cultural anthropology class. Okay, 
So let's talk a little bit about the origins of ethnography and the origins of cultural anthropology because so far I probably have given you the impression when we talked about cultural relativism and, and um, ethnocentrism um, or just culture in general, I maybe ha gave you the impression that anthropology is this um, this perfect field that we have where nobody's biased about anything and, um, you know, we have to have, you know, every, everything is uh, very, we're tolerant of all these differences that we observe in other cultures, um, but that's not the case. That it, It's not perfect. Our field these days is not perfect and um, it certainly did not come from perfect origins. So ethnography is doing research with other cultures and then publishing that research so that other people can learn from it, but in our ethnographic past as a field, anthropology has been very biased. It has had some major biases built into it because popular opinion during the, the century that it was really developing and, and becoming formulated as an academic field, the um, popular opinion at the time had a lot of racism and sexism and classism and in hindsight heteronormativity biases and all sorts of biases built into the popular opinion at the time that anthropology was being born. And so in a lot of the early research, a lot of the early ethnography, the process of collecting data was very different than it is today. Participant observation is something that has been added to this definition in the last century, but the century before it really wasn't part um, of, of the research process. And then the results that are published, we try very hard to make sure that they follow um, the ethics of doing research on humans and, the, um, and they're not ethnocentric. We don't show any of our biases in that research, that we use cultural relativism as a research technique. Um, when we are evaluating other cultures, we have become much more careful at doing um, anthropology, doing ethnography with a critical lens on ourselves to try to guard against our ethnocentrism and to employ the research technique called cultural relativism um, without letting it go too far, right? And, um, and hit on those issues of human rights. What is a basic human right? Um, so if you take ethnocentrism or cultural relativism too far, you can um, get into this human rights uh, issue, uh, which is kind of, there's not a clear cut definition that is acceptable to all people at the moment. So, okay, so let's talk about the early days of cultural anthropology. So, um, the early, in the early days, you did not have field work or participant observations. The depth or participant observation as the, the typical type of field work. Please look in your textbook for the definitions of both of those words. In the early days, you had something called armchair Armchair anthropology. Um, the word armchair means a comfy, a comfy place you sit. It's your favorite chair where you watched the Super Bowl or something, uh, you know, where you curl up and read and, and maybe fall asleep while you're doing it. Your armchair is a very comfy place. So armchair anthropology was the way ethnography was done. early on. Anthropologists stayed home and instead they gathered um, postcards, they gathered letters from tourists, they gathered diaries from tourists, they gathered um, missionary reports that were sent back to a parish church or something from a foreign land, and they gathered um, all kinds of scientific reports from naturalists, you know, people who went to the field other than themselves. So anthropologists stayed home and used other people's documents 
documents, such as those diaries, those postcards, those kinds of things, use other people's documents in order to, um, to gather information about a culture that they were interested in. So that's called armchair anthropology. And that is our root, um, or this is where we come from, or where ethnography comes from, is from people who stayed home and read other folks' accounts uh, of their travels. Um, the other folks, like we said, could be tourists, could be missionaries, Um, it could be scientists or naturalists. All of which, all of whom, I should say, all of whom have major biases in the way that they write about foreign cultures. There are major biases in the ways that tourists not only write about foreign cultures, but if any of you out there have been a tourist before, whether you go and actually stay in a hotel yourself, or whether you're staying with your Aunt Sue in her house or whatever, the experience that you have when you are visiting on the short term to a place, um, and as intentionally being a tourist, the experience that you have is not reality. Even if you stay with your Aunt Sue, chances are Aunt Sue, who is a native of the place you're visiting, chances are she's got um, different foods in her refrigerator than she normally does when she's alone with just her family. She's got those special things because you're there. Chances are you're not even getting you know, an accurate food picture of her daily life. Um, you probably aren't you know, actually seeing the daily habits of the people who live in Aunt Sue's house with her because you have disrupted kind of her daily life um, by, by your presence there. And so you don't really see daily life accurately within that household. And the reason you're there is to go and do fun, organized things that people who are native to the place don't really fill their daily lives with. You might go, as a tourist, you might go to a restaurant and you see people who live in that place are actually the ones who are cooking your food or serving you your meal, but that is not, um, you're not seeing their daily life experience. You're seeing a very small snapshot of their daily life experience um, because you're a tourist and you're not seeing that, you're just not seeing that reality. So tourists, when you write a postcard and send it home, if you're as old as I am, you used to do that, now you're going to send Snapchat and, and Instagram and maybe post on Facebook you know, of your trip to Disneyland or wherever you are, but you, you are sending messages home about your tourist experience and it doesn't really give you um, a clear picture of what daily life is like for the people who live there. Missionaries, I think we talked about missionaries in a previous lecture when we were talking about ethnocentrism. Religion in general, of course, this word missionary refers to somebody who wants to spread their religion to other groups. Um, and many of us regard that as, um, you know, a well-intended thing that a missionary wants to spread. Their, they believe in their religion. They believe it's the correct way. They want to spread it to others so more people are doing the correct way. Um, so missionaries have, at their core, very ethnocentric uh, motivations. Now, most of us don't judge them harshly for their ethnocentric motivations, um, most of us, I know myself, I am a religious person and I follow a particular religion and I was taught to believe that that particular religion was correct and those feelings that I am doing right by believing in my religion or your feelings about doing right by believing in your religion, these things are founded in ethnocentrism. Just like patriotism for country is founded in ethnocentrism. But, um, but missionaries in general, the reason you're going to go someplace else to spread your religion is because you have these ethnocentric motivations, okay? So um, missionaries, as well-meaning as they might be, um, they, are, they work with anthropologists sometimes to introduce um, an anthropologist to a foreign culture that they've already been a part of, and the anthropologist wants to be a part of it too, but in general, the motivation as to why a missionary goes to the culture or where a missionary goes, your motivation is to change that culture, change their ways. 
And so that is not the purpose of an anthropologist. We cannot have the purpose of bringing our idea of what social change should look like to a culture and imposing it on them. Now, some anthropologists work toward human rights issues and work to help educate people so that they can bring themselves out of issues that they themselves see as problematic for them. But we don't go into a culture with the intent of saying, our way that we're going to tell you about is correct and you need to change it. Um, so a missionary has that intention. And so we cannot look at a missionary's take on a foreign culture. We can't look at it as being free of bias. It's got a ton of biases simply because they're doing this um, work in another culture for the purpose of, of, of fixing, fixing something that they see as uh, problematic or wrong or whatever, whatever critique word you want to use there. So they're, they come from a place of ethnocentrism. The scientists and the naturalists at the time, and I'm talking about a time um, in the mid-1850s when this kind of anthropology was being practiced, um, the scientists and the naturalists at the time had their share of biases also, and they were pretty, pretty significant. Um, the entire Western world, um, which refers to your cultures of European descent, the entire Western world, the scientists and the naturalists from that area, were writing about other cultures, non-Caucasian cultures, in terms of Caucasian superiority and people of color inferiority. So racism and racist ideas um, were rampant in the scientific and the naturalist writings at this time, and that's what armchair anthropologists were using as fact. Um, for instance, there were some scientists that were, they were going to, um, watch my air quotes, they were going to prove that um, Caucasian people were the, the, um, the smartest, they had the greatest civilization of all people because of the size of, of our heads. So, so Caucasian people, apparently it was, they, the claim was at this time that Caucasian people had the largest heads, the largest cranium, and therefore it proved that if the brain was larger, then you were the best, you were smarter, you were more capable. This were, those kinds of things were the conclusions that biologists were making at this time in history. And those are the kinds of documents that armchair anthropologists were using to evaluate other cultures on kind of a continuum basis, a cultural evolution kind of basis. Um, it's pretty scary, actually, if you think about it, the you know, scientists trying to use um, skeletal information or biological information. It's not, not, just, not just racial biases, but they also tried to claim successfully, I won't say tried to claim, they successfully claimed uh, for a while that males were inherently superior to females because in general male skulls are larger than female skulls and therefore males are smarter was the conclusion. And these were scientific conclusions that were made at the time and they were taken as factual. So, um, so there are some major problems here that not only, you know, anthropology was not the only thing that suffered from this. Certainly some of the racism and the classism and the sexism and all the other isms, ageism even, all the other isms that are still social problems for you and me today in the 2000 teens, these, Problems have a deep, long history, long-rooted history, and anthropology was not free of those things. They were, it was not free of those influences. So armchair anthropology was a very, very um, biased way of doing anthropology, and uh, some of the conclusions, some of the early ethnographies from that time frame that I talked to you about classified civilizations, classified cultures of people, let me... Let me clarify my term here, because the word civilization is going to play into this in just a second. But it classified cultures and societies of people as savage, 
which was very loose organization, um, not a whole lot of rules, definitely not written rules, not a whole lot of rules, not a large population. They maybe used the word primitive to refer to savage. These are incorrect classifications, incorrect um, words to use that they used to use then to classify people. This eliminates cultural relativism. To classify people as savage um, or on a progression here with cultural evolution, on a progression, the next spot um, on the evolutionary cycle for cultural evolution was called barbarian, which had greater um, social organization, uh, but it was like ruled by uh, thugs, ruled by violence, basically, barbarian, and it did not have, you know, rule of law or educational attainment as its, um, you know, it wasn't classified by those things. So barbarian was the next one, and the next stop on the list, the next stop went to um, what these armchair anthropologists and other theorists and social scientists at the time called civilization. Civilization. So savage, barbarian, or civilization. And guess what the only civilized uh, group of people were at the time? Western culture. That's the way, or European culture is what that means that um, left out everybody else who was from a different continent, everybody else who had a different way of life, everybody else who had a different um, religious system or different customs, traditions, languages, these kinds of things, different uh, modes of dress or different um, ways of uh, cooking or food ways or even sex habits, all of these different kinds of things were, if, it, if they differed from the European ideal or differed from the Western culture ideal, then these things were not considered civilization. They were considered something more um, disorganized or primitive, and it was a very, ex, you know, a, a, a supremacy kind of attitude, this civilization thing being supreme, and these other groups not having achieved this supreme wonderfulness of civilization. And so there were extreme biases, not only in the science, but the missionaries used that scientific information to formulate their opinions, and the tourists, if they were reading um, you know, papers and, and things that uh, came from academe, uh, they were proceeding with the notion that Western culture was the best one. And so their writings would have all this reflected in it. So this is a problem. This is a, a major problem. Um, for the way that we evaluated, we anthropologists and scientists in general, evaluated other groups, other people, other cultures early on. So anthropology comes from a very racist, a very sexist, a very classist, elitist kind of approach to studying and classifying other cultures. That sounds like ethnocentrism to me, from what we have learned ethnocentrism is. So I know I told you early on, ethnocentrism is a problem for every single person, but um, an anthropologist has to be really careful about training ourselves to identify that in us and to get rid of it when we identify that. So um, early on, they didn't go through that process. They didn't identify ethnocentrism or even recognize it as an issue. They looked at the differences in culture as being evidence that some people had evolved to their full cycle of, of civilization and others had never taken the first step or some had taken some of the steps but are kind of stuck in limbo and this is the superior way to be. And that was the early, um, the early stages of anthropology, this is what um, we're dealing with, with some of the um, armchair anthropology that I just told you about. So, um, to fix all of this, in an effort to fix all of this, we have someone in American anthropology named Franz Boas. Franz Boas, 
He is known as the father of American anthropology or the father of cultural relativism. Franz Boas in the 1920s um, in the USA, I think he was at Columbia University in the USA, he called for um, a stop, he called for um, a research technique called cultural relativism that we already know about. Cultural relativism. Okay, so cultural relativism to review is a research technique that we're supposed to use when we're doing ethnography um, where we try to understand that culture from the point of view of somebody in that culture. We try to understand that culture from terms of their own history, in terms of their own customs, their own belief systems. And in order to do that, we have to start to identify um, ethnocentric biases and certainly extremist and elitist biases like the savage, barbarian, and civilization model that early anthropologists bought right into. Okay, so we ha he said stop buying into that, essentially, and start using cultural relativism. And that's where this word field work that you heard in that video about doing anthropology from the MIT anthropology department that they have on YouTube, the video that you watched, you heard this word field work and we've talked about it in our lectures too. This is... Um, uh, research that's conducted in the place where the people live and do the events and you know do the activities that you're interested in studying. So that's research in the place where the group lives. So an example of field work um, would be, an example of field work would be that, um, for instance, it, well, it talks about, I think in chapter one, about anthropologists being involved in the um, Yoplait yogurt company, and they developed um, Gogurt, which is, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, if you're in your early 20s, you've grown up with something like like Gogurt, where you can uh, have a tube and pull off, you know, snap the top off of it, squeeze it, and just throw everything away. It's all disposable. Well, anthropologists worked with um, Yoplait Yogurt to develop that um, because Yoplait wanted to know why aren't people sending, why aren't people taking our disposable containers of yogurt, why aren't they taking them to work or sending them to schools and the school lunches and stuff like that. Um, because, you know, it's a disposable can, we've made it as easy as we thought we could, you know, the research and development team was thinking that, but they didn't see yogurt sales go up. They wanted yogurt sales to go up because they were having these, you know, easier to open and easier to dispose of packages. So they sent anthropologists out into the field, and in this case, the field was the grocery store. So they would go to the grocery store and they would see somebody who looked like they had, you know, school lunch or work lunch items in their basket, and they would just go up with a clipboard Clipboard is a thing that held paper and your pen a long time ago before we would have our um, before we would have our iPad or something like that um, or your iPhone. They'd go up with their clipboard and with some questions and they would say, um, "Can I ask you a few questions? I see you have lunch items. Why haven't you picked yogurt?" And so over time, with all these anthropologists doing that field work in those grocery stores, over time, asking enough people, the answer was, we're not sending yogurt to lunch, you know, to school for lunch with our kids because we have to send a spoon with them and we'll never see our spoon again. Or if we send yogurt and we don't want to send our real spoon from the kitchen, we have to have an added expense of buying plastic spoons that they can throw away with their yogurt cup. And so research and development got that information and decided to put um, yogurt in a tube, like toothpaste was in a tube, and everything was disposable at the end. And so there is an example of some field work, and the field actually was um, in the grocery store where the daily life experience was going on that, that they were interested in. Um, other field work is more complicated than that, as we will see in, in just a second. Um, that kind of field work is not called participant observation 
that I mentioned to you in that definition of ethnography, the first part of this discussion. But let me tell you, um, let, let's talk about participant observation right now because that's the kind of thing that you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to uh, address and, and evaluate in your first project. So let me get this erased and then we will talk about that. Okay. So, um, participant observation. It, you should be able to easily deduce what this means by looking at um, by looking at the words uh, in, in the vocabulary word. Participant observation. Okay? Participant observation is a field work process. It's, a, it's an ethnographic method where a researcher Researchers go to the cultural location they go to the culture's location and spend time with a group participating in the daily activities, thus the word participant. They spend time with the group um, taking part in their activities taking part in activities formulating questions gathering data and asking questions of their informant or conversation partner. Um, I, I'll leave this to the word informants here. You have noticed in your textbook that there are five or six different words for the informant. Um, thing, but the informant is your buddy that you have in the culture. My professors at Arkansas State University, where I'm a student right now, um, my professors who do ethnography, instead of using the word informant, use the word um, conversation partner, which is which is nice. You, uh, some people just say partner. Some people say interlocutor. Some people say um, consultant, informant. Uh, most people these days don't like the word informant. It kind of sounds like some kind of FBI thing, a sting operation or something, um, or giving secret information um, that's not supposed to be shared. We don't mean it that way in anthropology. So conversation partner is a nice kind of um, benign uh, thing you know, that you can call the individual who is your buddy, who you hang out with while you're taking part in the activities of that person's culture. Because you're going to have, questions are going to come up when you're taking part in the activities. If you are in a culture that's very foreign to you, questions are definitely going to come up. So you have to, um, you have to have somebody to bounce those questions off of and give you additional information, you know, gather data not only from what your experiences themselves were, but after you ask somebody a question, you gather information about that too, and that's part of the observation process. You take part, you formulate questions while you're taking part, you gather data about what's happening, and then ask those questions and get more information from those informants. Okay. So participant observation is what Franz Boas called for. He said we got to put a stop to this um, armchair anthropology stuff. We can't um, we can't rely on untrained people, uh, people who are not um, aware about the problems of ethnocentrism, and people who are who are biased against other cultures because of their belief system or something. We can't rely on their information to get an accurate picture of a culture. And so he said we really need to do participant observation in order to 
you know, try to cleanse ourselves of our cultural biases, sometimes the questions that come up might reveal some of our cultural biases. Sometimes the questions that come up might, um, might be sensitive in nature, just like when we watched the video about um, circumcision. This woman was sitting around with other women and just the topic came up. So she found out about female circumcision that way. So you never know what you're going to find out about, so you have to be really open to, um, to these issues. Um, and that's your observation part. How do you gather data and compile it? Okay, so this is what Franz Boas called for. And this is how we do cultural anthropology these days, to try to prevent ourselves from being negatively affected by our own biases, because all of us have these biases. We might not be, some of us are aware of them, others are not aware of the biases that we have necessarily. So we have to um, try to prevent those biases from showing up in our research, because then it is, um, it's not valid or reliable research when we do that. Okay, so um, let's talk about the research process itself um, and how do we get permission and how do we get help in formulating our participant observations, suggestions that we want to do. Okay, and so there is, um, there's a process that you have to go through to make sure that the ethics of, of your field, the ethics of working with human beings are followed at all times because we have to be very careful and not um, endanger ourselves or the people that we're going to spend time with. We have to be careful not to call um, negative attention to the people that we're interested in. Uh, for instance, if you're in a foreign place and there is civil war or conflict going on and you're interested in just one side of it and you bring a camera and start shooting or you, you know, start doing Facebook Live events you know, with these people, that could call a lot of undue attention to them and put you and them in danger. Um, you could uh, you know, give away a location or something if location services are on on your phone or, or whatever. So all of these kinds of details that you and I just might not think, um, think about on a daily basis, all these kinds of details have to be covered in anthropological research because you, the researcher, has to be protected and ethical the organization you work for, whether it's a private industry like Yoplait Yogurt or whether it is the University of California at Berkeley or wherever it is that you're working, the institution that you're affiliated with has to be protected and the people that you're interested in studying have to be protected from any kind of um, unfortunate attention that might cause them harm or might, you know, bring some kind of illegal, illegal activity to light or something. So, um, so you have to be careful with all of that. So when you're formulating your ideas about where or how you're going to do your participant observation, you have to, as an anthropologist, um, whether you work for private industry or for the state or, or an academic institution, um, you have to bounce your ideas for research off your colleagues who are also anthropologists and also social scientists. You have to bounce your ideas off them a lot and get a lot of input on formulating your research plan. And then you don't stop there. You, after you get all their input and their help, you have to go through an approval process that starts at your organization's level with something called an IRB which stands for Institutional Review Board, okay? It's a committee. It's a committee of people. It's my abbreviation for people. It's a committee of people who um, evaluate your research plan They evaluate your research plan and they give you pointers um, about how to improve it or they point out maybe if you have overlooked an ethical issue and especially since anthropologists are working with human subjects, they pay particular attention in these kinds of uh, human subject 
participant observation, anthropological kind of research studies, they pay particular attention to are you bringing harm or un unfortunate attention or could your presence or your research have any kind of detrimental effect on the population that you're interested in? Could, you know, have you overlooked danger that you yourself could possibly be a part of? Um, so they, they evaluate your research plan and identify dangers or ethical issues that maybe you and your colleagues, because you're too close to it, have overlooked. Okay, so they're going to evaluate this to see if anything, you know, might have been overlooked uh, in the, you know, department level um, or social scientist level review. So the members of this committee for the Institutional Review Board, the members are going to come from all over the place. And in the case of academics, you're going to have somebody from uh, the math department and somebody from the hospitality program and somebody from um, technical writing and uh, you know, a history instructor, and you're going to have people from the administration, like maybe the director of the alumni or something like this. You're going to have a whole bunch of people from a whole bunch of different backgrounds look at your research and evaluate it. Because you've already had a whole bunch of people from your field look at it and evaluate it. But just like sometimes we can't see our, our own typographical errors in paragraphs that we've written, Sometimes we can't see that because we're too close to the work and we give it to our friend to read it for us and immediately they find like two typos that we just never saw. That's because we're too close to that work. Sometimes people who are in the field and too close to that work itself can overlook issues that bring up red flags for people who are outside of our field. So if you have a, you know, a professor of Renaissance music or something on the Institutional Re Review Board, they will look at your research plan with the very refreshing point of view of, of a child even because they maybe don't really have an anthropo anthropology or social science research background at all, maybe. And so you want somebody with really fresh eyes and a really fresh perspective. You want many people, the entire committee, to look at this and give you pointers um, and then approve uh, your research or suggest, you know, suggest modifications before they improve it. And so you have to go through this kind of process also. Okay, so after the institutional review board process, you, after you've been approved, then you have to um, go through another approval process, and this time it's with the people that you're interested in studying, okay? Because you can't just like show up and say, I'm here, you didn't know I was coming, but this is what I want to do, and here are my TV cameras behind me. You can't do it that way. You have another step that you have to go through, and that step is called informed consent. Informed consent. Okay, so this is the play. Consent, of course, means to agree. So this is the part of the research where members of the culture who you are interested in studying, you have to tell them, give them all the information about what your goals are. You have to give the information about what your goals are, and they have to agree to allow you to do your research before you can begin.
Okay. So informed consent. You have to give up all of the information about what, what your focus is and why you're doing this research. And you have to do that with the members of the community that you're interested in studying. Or, um, it, you know, you can't proceed. Even after the IRB might have approved your, um, your research plan, you can't proceed until you have agreement of the members of that community. And before they can technically officially agree, um, you have to give them all that information. They have to be able to understand it. So if somebody speaks a different language than what your research study is written in, then you're going to have to have somebody translate that for them or read it to them or um, you know, rewrite it in their language or something so they can read it for themselves. So there's a, you know, a great deal of approval that has to go on in the culture itself that you're interested in studying. Okay. And this is also the time when you would develop um, who your conversation partner or who your consultant or informant would be within the society. Um, you have to make sure that whoever agrees to your being there has authority to agree, and, but sometimes that person does not end up being actually your conversation partner that you have a lot of interaction with. So you have to, um, you know, identify that person. Sometimes that's a very informal process once you've gone through informed consent. Other times, um, you know, the, the person who gives you consent is going to be really specific. Like, you can do this, but you have to hang out with your conversation partner must be this particular individual over here. Um, so uh, informed consent and identifying um, your uh, conversation partner is all part of that approval process. And that is not without its biases either, because being a female going into the field and having a conversation partner, my conversation partner is probably going to be female, um, whereas a male anthropologist is probably going to have a male conversation partner. And so we also have to be careful or identify, you know, ad admit early on, okay, I am doing participant observation, but really the only side of society that I'm going to see is the female side of society. So there's a whole other side that I haven't seen yet. That was also one of the biases built into early anthropology. There were so many men doing it and claiming that, you know, the male side of society was where the important stuff, here's my, I better put that in air quotes, important stuff um, was happening. And so, you know, it was very what we call androcentric or male-centered. Um, so we have to admit, you know, as a female anthropologist in the field, there's a lot of stuff about that culture that you're not going to witness or experience because it's off limits to females and vice versa. So these are the very important um, processes that you have to go through in order to be able to conduct your field work as an anthropologist. Sometimes it's very clear cut. Sometimes the approval process just doesn't take any time at all. You still have to go through it. But um, other times, such as in the case with this book that um, I wanted to show you, this particular um, ethnography that was done in, oh gosh, I think it was done in the 1980s. It's called Righteous Dope Fiend. Anyway, this fellow um, from a university in San Francisco, I believe, wanted to conduct ethnography with a group of homeless people who were known heroin users and heroin addicts. He wanted to conduct participant observation with a group of um, homeless people in San Francisco. So I've just said the word homeless. Um, probably if we look at ourselves and look at our behavior, examine our conscience, so to speak, for just a moment, we might find that some of us have some biases toward homelessness. We maybe blame people for laziness or blame people for not finding a job or say that their homeless nature is their fault or something of this nature. Um, you know, if you see a homeless person on the street, many of us look the other way and try to ignore that they're there and hope they don't speak to us or something like that. There are a lot of biases in that master status we know of as homeless or homelessness. So this fellow wanted to study homelessness, and he had a graduate student with him. He wanted to focus on um, this homeless population that lived um, like under an overpass, I think it was, or some, something having to do with a highway location in San Francisco that they were constantly being kicked out of because it was illegal for them to just to set up a, a camp city there. Um, and they were running from the police, and they were trying to set back up a little town someplace else or a little camp 
someplace else so that they could just survive. And they were shooting each other up with shared needles with heroin because they were drug addicts. That's what the word dope fiend means. It's a very, um, he used it intentionally, this word dope fiend, because it was a derogatory term at the time. And, um, and probably still is today for the people who still use it. But it was like, it, it has a bias built into it. Like we talked about words showing ethnocentric values too. So the word dope fiend has um, an ethnocentric quality to it because a fiend is certainly somebody who's like out of their mind and unpredictable and dangerous, right? So dope, you know, is the drug itself. And anyway, so this guy had a lot of issues to deal with as far as IRB approval. There were a lot of ethical considerations that he had to um, that he had to answer for before he could get approval. Um, a lot of the behaviors that you have to do to be successful at a homeless lifestyle, a lot of those behaviors are um, illegal according to um, according to local and state laws. Things like dumpster diving is usually illegal. Loitering is usually illegal. Panhandling is usually illegal. Those kinds of things are behaviors that most people, if you're homeless, in order to be successful at being homeless, you have to engage in those activities at least some of the time. And so you're always, you know, running from police or your people are shouting that they've called the police and to get away from their business or whatever. So you don't really trust people, um, you know, mainstream people um, who aren't homeless themselves. You don't really place a lot of trust in them. So, um, and the drug use, certainly, and needle sharing, which causes a major public health issue, whereas you could maybe catch AIDS from sharing a needle or catch hepatitis or any of those other blood-borne diseases. Um, he had a whole lot of ethical questions that he had to answer from his IRB. And then, to get informed consent, he had a whole other set of hurdles to go over because the people he was interested in studying did not have good experiences with mainstream individuals. You know, mainstream individuals were the people who crossed the street to walk on the other sidewalk so that they, did, they could avoid them, or they were the ones calling the cops to tell them to stop hanging outside of McDonald's that, where they're loitering, or they were the ones who, you know, threw, threw stuff at them or shouted bad names at them as they drove by or whatever. There's a stigma associated with it then and now. Um, so he had a lot of problems um, getting the homeless population to uh, accept him, right? So he was going to tell them, why am I there? I'm there to study your way of life and to shed light on what the behaviors are that you have to go through in order to be successful at this and, um, you know, identify any kinds of issues that you might have um, that, that, you know, can be helped, like, uh, you know, homeless housing being provided or um, needle sharing programs, uh, or excuse me, needle exchange programs so that needle sharing could stop. That was one of um, the social benefits that affected us all that came from research like his. Um, so needle sharing um, was a huge problem um, that, that caused blood-borne diseases to be spread from one person to the next in the population. And um, there wasn't a way to dispose of dirty needles well, and, and needles were hard to come by. And so one of the things that resulted from research like, like his research were needle exchange programs where a person could, on, on a don't ask, don't tell kind of basis, a person could show up at a center that had um, needles to give out and they could drop off their dirty ones and get clean ones so that they could use it because they were addicts after all. There was a lot of social outcry about needle exchange programs because some people said some maybe maybe is it right to say some ethnocentric people said you're just enabling them to be the, to be a drug addict but that wasn't the purpose of the needle exchanges. The, the purpose was to cut down on the number of times that AIDS was transmitted from person to person because they were sharing dirty needles or hepatitis or any of those other things that you can get from sharing dirty needles with an infected person. So it wasn't about um, 
other initiatives have come about to try to help people overcome their drug addiction. That particular initiative came about to try to help um, with a public health issue that was costing everybody money, regardless of whether you were out there sharing needles yourself and were infected with AIDS yourself. It was costing all of us money, um, and still does, because we, um, we pay uh, taxes for the support of the medical and the healthcare management systems in our country then and now, and the higher the medical costs, the more taxes are necessary from all of us in order to pay for those. And so it was um, a way to try to, those needle exchange programs were a way to try to cut down on that public health issue that affected us all, not just the homeless population in San Francisco. So you can look uh, Righteous Dope Fiend up online. You won't find like the contents of the book. I checked this out from our university library. But um, you'll find a lot of good, short, easy to read articles about the kinds of things that he and his graduate student experienced while they were um, participating and observing with this particular um, population um, of people. And it'll give you a lot of food for thought for about the ethical considerations that an anthropologist might face when they're trying to get their research plan approved. It's not, not all research is about developing a product like Gogurt, for instance. So, um, so read your chapter three if you haven't already done so. Refer to this information for your project one. You're going to read in project one uh, an ethnographic case study. It's only 11 or 12 pages long. You're going to read an ethnographic case study and have questions to answer from these first three units. You're going to have an IRB question like we talked about today. You'll have an ethnocentrism question, a cultural relativism question, participant observation question, ethics questions. So you need your notes from several of these past lectures that you've seen in order to successfully complete it. So look for it on Blackboard soon. Thank you and goodbye.